Ugh, this is not gonna work. I hate this thing so much. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Longtime viewers will know that I've complained exactly 58 times about this crappy budget slitting saw arbor that I use for small slitting saws. I've got a job coming up where this thing is not going to cut it, so there won't be a 59th time. I'm finally going to make myself a decent slitting saw arbor. So let's go. Let's take a look at the problems that we're solving. This is a so-called universal slitting saw arbor. You can buy these things everywhere, and they have this little stepped cone in them, and whatever diameter your slitting saw uses sits on that particular diameter and then the other diameters are spring loaded and compress into the arbor which seems clever but as you can see there's a lot of moving parts here and so there isn't a lot of concentricity or rigidity in this thing and well it's not very well made either however the real faustian bargain with this is because of that collapsing step cylinder business you have to have this big cap that goes on the bottom because it has to have the diameter and the depth to encompass all of those steps and so you lose all of your reach with the slitting saw so i've only got 300 or so thou here of reach with this saw but if you look at the saw itself it's quite large i should have maybe up to 600 thou of reach with this saw and this is a very steep limitation that i encounter quite a bit and the other big one that gets me constantly is the thickness of the underside of this arbor. What this means is that you basically can never make slits above the vise because the part is going to be sticking up so high because of that arbor that you lose all of your rigidity. And so you'd have to do all of your slitting operations off down to the side of the vise, which is frequently inconvenient. Here's my design that I hope is a little better. So the arbor there in yellow goes into the spindle and then the cap shown in teal screws into that and the shoulder on the cap registers on the slitting saw and keeps it concentric and then that shoulder also registers on the counter bore of the arbor to keep all three pieces concentric. And then the thread draws that shoulder in as needed to take up different thicknesses of slitting saws. This is my little collection of small slitting saws. Most of these were uh, donated to the channel, so thank you to my viewers. And they seem to fall into two main categories, but luckily 80% of them have the same arbor size. They're all about 510 thou, which is a strange size, but I'm pretty sure these are metric. I think that's probably supposed to be 13 millimeter. So this arbor is gonna fit these saws and that's gonna cover 80% of my use cases, but I'll show you how to adjust it for smaller saws if needed. Got a scrap of steel here that I'm going to use for this, and this happens to be 12L14 steel, but you could make it out of just about anything. It's not a very high demand application. This happens to already be machined, but I am going to put a center in there and then get some tail support going. Now I'm going to turn it down to whatever is a convenient size for the size of saw that you're going to run and the collet that you want to put this in. So in this case, with a 510 thou hole in the saw, uh, 625 was kind of the closest collet size that was also going to leave sufficient material gripping the center of the saw to provide enough friction to keep it from spinning in the arbor. So that's kind of the goal is you want the arbor to be as small a diameter as you can get away with to maximize the reach of the saw but still fit in a collet and still have enough friction on that saw. So I'm going to leave the OD a little bit large for now. You'll see why here in a minute. Uh, but this is also the point where I realized I forgot to face the end, as is supposed to be tradition. So I went back and did that as well. Next up is the tapping drill size for the thread on the cap. And that's going to vary depending on how small of a saw you're trying to hold here. But you can check out my drawings to see what I used for this arbor. After this, I'm going to be boring out the counter bore that holds the shoulder of the cap and thus keeps the saw concentric. You typically would see me start this with a two flute end mill mounted in the tailstock to create a nice flat spot for the boring bar to start. But a viewer recently sent me these DeWalt pilot point drills that have a flat grind on them. And so uh, he suggested I try these out. And yeah, actually I can say that worked very well. So I went up in two sizes and that was less of a good idea. I think you want to go to your final size right off the bat because of course after the first size there's no longer a pilot hole for the point on this drill. So it wanders a lot as it engages the material but that's okay. I still left it undersized to finish up with the boring bar. 
Now the larger drill did chatter in the bottom of that hole. You'll see some chatter marks here later. So you do need to run them quite a bit slower than a normal drill, but I think you can run them faster than the two flute end mill. So I think it is still a faster way to do this. So give this a try. I'll link to these drills down below, but of course you can also just grind a regular drill to have a flat profile like that if you are so inclined. Next up is the boring bar to bring this to the final dimension needed for the cap shoulder that holds the saw. So I'm aiming for 5.11 here, a 1 thou clearance slip fit on there. This worked out okay, but it would have been better if I'd started with the cap because you always want to start with the part that is the least mutable. The hole in the slitting saws doesn't change and I have to fit that perfectly. So I should have made the cap first because the cap has to fit that and then made this counter bore to fit the cap. But with that counter bore done, I'll go in now with the tapping size for the cap. And I went in with a taper tap and then chased it up with a bottoming tap as well, just to make sure I have as much thread depth in there as possible. Lastly, I'm going to come in with the chamfering tool and clean up some of the edges. This inside edge, I just want to break it. Just make sure there's no burr on that because I need that to register well on the shoulder. And then I'll... Uh, chamfer the inside of that uh, hole there a little bit in case there's a shoulder on the thread. And I did not chamfer the OD because we're not done with that yet. I am, however, going to set up to part it off now. So the length here is pretty flexible because it's going in a collet. So yeah, whatever feels good to you. You can look at the drawing if you want to see exactly what dimension I felt was going to work. And we just have to part this thing off. Yahtzee. And with that remaining material, I can just slide it back into the right length here for the cap. Face off the end to get rid of that parting detritus. And now I need to turn down the rest of this OD to match the smaller OD that's left over from the arbor there. A clever person would have turned both of these parts in one setup instead of doing it in two separate like I'm doing here, but, well, you're stuck with me. For the finishing pass, I just very carefully touch off on the existing small diameter and then finish it down. Again, this doesn't have to be perfect because we're going to do one more pass on both parts here in a minute anyway. To mark the final length of the cap, I'm going to blue up the area there, and because I'm a terrible human being who doesn't deserve to exist, I'm going to make a light mark in that ink with my calipers. I look forward to deleting many colorful comments on this topic. And the actual length of this part is not super critical, so I just turn a light pass up to that line by eye, and then I set an indicator and zero it on the carriage so that I can do subsequent passes up to that same point and get a nice clean shoulder, but the actual depth doesn't matter. Now, let's see here how far I have to go. So now I'm turning the shoulder that's going to hold the actual saw. So this is the most critical dimension. So I'm taking my time here to make sure I get this right. When I think I'm close, I deburr the end there with a file just to make sure it doesn't interfere with my fit. If there's a burr, it could make me think that the diameter is too large because the saw doesn't fit. But the saw does in fact go on there. It's very close, so you have to get the saw very straight, but that's a good sign. That's what we want. And that seems like a really good fit, so I'm happy with that. I'll try a different saw just to make sure that they're all consistent, and they are indeed. So, so far so good. So that's the shoulder. That shoulder should also be a good fit on the counter bore in the arbor, so I'll check that now as well, and that's pretty good. I ended up with about a 2 thou slip fit there instead of 1 thou, so not as good as I was, I was aiming for, but it's still definitely going to work. And I'm still a bad person, so I marked out the length of the thread the same way, and I turned that diameter down, and then on the final pass I lock the carriage, wind out the cross slide to face off the shoulder, and end up with nice finishes and good dimensions on both surfaces. Looking pretty decent so far, and I'm going to come in with my chamfer tool and put a very generous chamfer on that because this is going to be the threaded area and it'll help the thread start. It's kind of a quality of life thing when you're using the arbor, and it also helps the die start on the diameter there to start cutting the threads. Speaking of the die, I can bring that in now with my tailstock die holder. You could single point cut these threads if you were feeling fancy, but I am not feeling fancy. I just want to cut some threads, and this will be quick and easy. 
Now I didn't do any kind of undercut at the base of these threads, so that means that this shoulder won't seat tight against the inside shoulder on the arbor, but that doesn't actually matter because there's always going to be a slitting saw in there. But you could if you wanted to. We've got enough parts here to test everything together, so I'll put the saw on there, thread the arbor on there, and let's see if that tightens up on the saw properly, and it does. So that seems quite good. Well, I can't resist spinning it up and seeing how it looks, and it looks good. You can see some run out in the arbor there, and that's because we haven't finished turning the OD of this thing yet, and these two parts were made in different setups. So we're going to correct that here right now. So I take the saw off and I tighten the arbor on as far as it'll go. You can see again there's a little gap there because of that uh, shoulder on the base of the thread, but that's okay. It's going to suffice for this. Then I just do a very fine cut all the way down both parts. Because the stock hasn't moved from when I turned the shoulder on the cap that holds the slitting saw, then that shoulder is now concentric with the OD of the arbor because I've now cut them both in one setup. That's the key here to make the slitting saw arbor as concentric as possible. So I'm just checking the dimension now in three places, make sure there's no taper. And it looks good, but I am a few tenths large. I'll test fit it on the collet here. And it does fit, but it's a little snug, a little snugger than I would like. So for quality of life here, I will polish it down a few tenths and just make it a nicer slip fit in that 5 eighths collet. Now I can put a nice chamfer on the end of the arbor. I'm doing that with a file instead of a chamfering tool because the setup here is not rigid. This arbor is long, there's a lot of stick out, and it's only being held in by that threaded shaft there on the cap. So low tool pressure is the order of the day, which means a file, and I'm also going to file the parting nubbin off there. So I don't have to try to turn that again. I don't have rigidity for that either. Over to the mill now with the cap. Before I part it off, I want to use the excess stock to hold it here in the mill, and I'm going to put some wrench flats on this cap. The key to achieving a really low profile cap here is wrench flats rather than trying to put some kind of bolt or other fastener in the cap that would add a lot of thickness to it. To calculate the depth of cut for wrench flats on a part, you can do a lot of math to figure out exactly what it should be, or you could do what I do, which is I go over to my wrench drawer and measure all the wrenches, and I find one that's a little bit smaller than the OD of the round stock. Subtract that size from the round stock, divide it by two, that's your depth of cut on each side, and then a call-up block makes it easy to index 180 degrees, and then just a test fit with the wrench. Now the secret here is you want to end up with sufficient surface area on the flats that the wrench will have a good purchase. So you don't want to go too small with those flats or else the wrench is going to round them over immediately. And then on the fit, you want just a couple of thou of clearance. Again, if you have too much clearance, the wrench is going to tend to round off the corners of the flats. But if you have too little clearance, that's a quality of life problem. It's fussy to get the wrench on and off. So there's a balance there. And now back over to the lathe to part off the cap since we no longer need that extra stock there to hold on to it. Okay, the parts are done. Let's give this thing a little test drive here. So the slitting saw goes on the cap like so. You can see the registration shoulder there. And then the whole thing threads into the arbor. And then we can use the wrench flats to snug it down with whatever wrench happened to be a good size. In this case, it's a 14 millimeter wrench flat on a 5 8 arbor because I am a monster. All right, well, it's shiny, but does it actually do the job? Let's go head to head with the commercial arbor. Here's the commercial arbor spinning up and look at the runout in that thing. Now, slitting saws always have some runout in them. That's how they're made but that is excessive. I mean, even the arbor itself has run out in it that you can see there, especially the cap, and there's very little saw exposed. Now let's spool up the new one and look at that. I mean, there's still a tiny bit of perceptible run out in that saw, but the arbor is running perfectly as far as I can tell, and it's just night and day. And look at all of the real estate there on that saw that we have access to now. And then of course the other huge win here is the clearance underneath that arbor. You can see this close setup here that I had recently on a job and that just would not have been possible with that old crappy commercial arbor. So that's my little slitting saw arbor. I can make another one of these now for my smaller saws, but uh, I hope you will make one of these too. It really is a huge quality of life improvement for these little saws, makes them so much more useful. 
Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this little project. Again, drawings and models are on my Patreon. And if you like what I'm doing, throw me a little love over there, not just for the drawings, but because love. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.